Massive thank you as always to our top tier patron, Sarah Turner. For as little as $3, you can gain access to patron-only episodes, as well as access to our Discord server, where we host weekly live discussions with host Ekoi Hero and myself. So if you like what you hear, come join us at patreon.com forward slash it's not just in your head. Please do rate us on Apple Podcasts and follow us on social media. We're on Reddit, TikTok, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And if you have any questions or comments about this episode or the podcast in general, then email it's not just in your head at gmail.com. Today, we talk with Jason Miles, host of This Is Revolution podcast, about his experiences working with the homeless population and also being homeless himself. In the mental health field, too often, we've made it seem as if it's just in your head. Just in your head. Like the landlord can hijack the rent by 20%. That impacts people's mental health. We can't have a profit-driven mental health care system if we want our people to be connected and healthy. We really are excited to have you talk about homelessness or the unhoused. Is that the way it's more correct to, to describe it? Um, Me personally, I... I remember, so I lived in this warehouse in uh, in West Oakland and not in that cool bohemian chic way you live in a warehouse. Yeah. Where, <laughs> I'm squatting somewhere <laughs> and I'm paying someone cash so you know they don't report to anyone that, that a few of us are living here kind of way. And there was a very large, is, is, it's, I, I went there recently, actually two weeks ago. And there's still, it's a massive homeless encampment across the street. And, you know, they're your neighbors. And I remember they kind of had, I don't want to say a leader. It sounds, it's, it sounds kind of almost like I'm telling a joke, but I'm not. There was a woman that kind of would represent them when, when interests would come around, right? Because there's always going to be some sort of philanthropic interests that come around that want to take advantage of um, you, be it. I can bring camera crews down here and and give you food and blankets and stuff and like so they she would kind of negotiate with either the business owners or or philanthropic interests people that would want to take advantage of them for something right there's always something you can take advantage of with with unhoused people to feel good about yourself and she once said um I like the term curb adjacent <laughs> She goes, we're not homeless here. We're curb adjacent. I was like, hmm, okay. Yeah. So I've, I've, never, I've never understood uh, the proper terminology. It's, it's one of those things where, you know, uh, uh, are they going to get mad at you? Is, is the whole community going to get mad if you use verbiage that might sound offensive? Um, I think homeless is, is pretty accurate. Because there's something to be said about not truly, you know, having a home. And then, you know, also in major metropolitan areas, you have to fight with things like rats. And right. Cops. You know. Cops, too. Cop. Well, you know, I, look, I know you guys are in a different area of the country. Uh, cops in Oakland are a little different. And they just don't care. Oh, okay. New so, York, they're quite brutal. New York, they are very, I found that out the hard way. Uh, New York is not like where I'm from. But so for the most part, you know, people, you know, people don't want to get dirty because you're dealing with, you know, kind of the quote unquote unwashed masses. So you know, no cop wants to have someone that's, you know, covered in God knows what in their car. So generally they're like, we're only going to come here if it's an emergency. And even then we don't want to come here. So when I was leaving, and this was just recent, it's funny, it was recently, I saw this on the news recently, finally. When I was there um, two years ago, like living there, uh, RVs were blowing up left and right. And I don't know if you ever heard an RV blow up, but it's a very jarring sound. Cars blowing up is one thing, but an RV blowing up is like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm awake now. And they were blowing up left and right. Sometimes it'd be because they were, you know, making stuff in it. Sometimes it would be because of people trying to do too much electric with electrical and tapping lines for this and plugging too much stuff in and, and messing around. Um, sometimes it was like the wrong person pissed off the wrong person. People were throwing Molotovs into people's RVs. But, uh, RVs and cars were catching on fire left and right. And for the most part, you would never really see 
law enforcement come around. Right. Well, in New York, the cops are quite brutal. And when they come in and smash up homeless encampments, they give the people the alternative to go to a shelter. But the shelters are so dangerous that people would much rather be on the street. And so they don't accept that invitation. There's community on the street, right? Yeah, there is. And people will come by and they'll give you money. Plus, there's community of people living together and protecting each other. And there isn't that in the shelters. You go to sleep in a big dorm room with no privacy. And they charge the city, I think, $600 a night for what is bunk beds and a big political ripoff. And you get robbed, you get raped while you're sleeping. Mm -hmm. And so people... You know, if they had individual rooms and took over these empty hotels, people would opt for it. But they don't want to sleep out in the open with a large population, which may include predators. But what is the mental health effect? I'm sorry, Ikoi, what were you saying? Oh, no, I was, you know, I mean, it's also one of the the shelters can be um, extremely restrictive. Yes. You know, and I think a huge part of like, you know, is having a somewhat not safe roof over your head any better than like at least being with friends and having no roof over your head, you know, yeah. unless, right, unless there's extenuating um, issues like weather or whatnot, it generally isn't a compelling answer. Yeah. Also in New York City, because it's very expensive to repair your building, people who have to repair the facade of their building, because if the stones fall on people, they could get sued, even if they don't care about the people who the stones are falling on. So if they put up scaffolding, then the stones fall on the scaffolding, and that's much cheaper than repairing your apartment. So all over New York, there's scaffolding. Mm-hmm. And people can live under the scaffolding because that's some kind of shelter. Oh my goodness. Well, it's, I think, uh, I don't know, if, I, I'm sure you guys don't follow LA housing all that close. Um, the LA Times. I do. I do. Well, <laughs> because you I live are, close. To, yeah, I am in Southern California. Somewhat, so, like, yeah. you know, still a little bit ways away from LA. I, I, I drove there recently. I drove there yesterday, actually. Um, there was a really interesting article in the LA Times, and I will say, they cover housing pretty fairly. Um, and they did a piece on a landlord that is a kind of a beloved figure in the philanthropic world. Um, he is housing, uh, I think, the most Section 8 people in L.A. County, which is the biggest county in the state. Um, but there's a lot of problems with those buildings because... As you said, uh, Dr. Fraud, uh, you're talking about really old buildings that need a lot of work. Mm-hmm. We don't have them as old as, as you guys in New York, but they're definitely pretty old in, in Los Angeles. Yeah. And he's skirting certain uh, uh, work requirements as far as using non-union labor. Mm-hmm overworking people because ultimately the private sector wants to prove that they can get things done more efficiently than the public sector. So he's getting buildings built faster. Um, and, and I wouldn't say larger, but just faster and cheaper than going traditional routes through the state. And he's using his investment capital. And he went on a bit of a buying spree over the last few years. And he actually has built some brand new <clears throat> units that he's using for affordable housing. But these are Section 8 units, right? So he's going to get a lot of that money guaranteed. Of course. It's right. a very good investment for him. And once you say you've done that, no one's going to ask questions about the conditions of said units. Mm-hmm. Right. And you can pick and choose who you put in those units. Unlike uh, my good friend Randy Shaw that runs uh, the Tenderloin Housing uh, in San Francisco, which is kind of what you were you were mentioning, you know, hotels, single room occupancy or SROs is what we call mm-hmm. them. Uh, I do look at SROs and the taking over of, of certain hotels as um, a, a really 
first step solution. Mm -hmm. If you want to think about immediate responses, because it does take away kind of um, the horrors of what you were describing with the shelter situations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, People have their own room, they have their own bathroom, they have their own autonomy for the most part. Um, And you can still have community. Did that happen at all during COVID? Did they house people in hotels and stuff? They certainly did in the UK, but I don't know about America. Well, in New York, there's all these luxury hotels that are empty, but they're not using them. Well, that's the thing, right? Because what happens is once they come in, you're never really going to rent those rooms out to to, uh, the public anymore because they are going to get destroyed. Because it got to the point where I can, I'll, I'll speak for what was going on in, in the, the Bay Area with some of the hotels we were running. Um, there was one that was a COVID hotel that if you tested positive for COVID and, and they were pretty much going into the shelters and a lot of shelters were blowing up with COVID. And mm-hmm. there was a hotel for COVID people that also housed, I don't know if you guys remember, when COVID was first hit, hitting, it rocked the prison system really hard, especially yes. San Quentin. Mm-hmm. So, so all of the counties in California said, we're not taking your released prisoners. So like two by two, these guys were getting released to these hotel facilities so they could quarantine for 21 days. So keep in mind that if people had finished their sentence, they sat for months. Some died. So we had not only unhoused people, we also had guys getting out and and quarantining in one hotel. And that hotel, you stayed inside for 23 hours a day. You got three 20-minute breaks. Um, They supplied you with cigarettes and these little shot bottles, like maybe like a hotel. Little Mm -hmm. shot bottles. Or like the airline little thing. Yeah, Uh, Even better, like the airline thing. And uh, you got food. They gave you three meals a day. Um, Water if you needed it. Um, but you also have your own bathroom or whatever. But you could smoke inside. Smoke anything. Cigarettes, crack, whatever you want to smoke. You could do it inside. So those rooms got thrashed. Yeah, I bet. Are there any like fires and stuff like that as well? Yes. Yes. True story. I want to tell you a true story. My second day we had... So, the, so if you think about hotels... I don't know if this is a downside, but it's just an observation. They're made for privacy. They're not made for surveillance. Right. And, and we're right. dealing with a population that we want to surveil to some point. And I can't speak for all the hotels in California because I don't know where all the LA ones. And I know San Diego did some too. Um, but the ones that we were dealing with, they were all in the hood. So that illegal economy definitely jumped on our spot really quick because there was a few hotel owners that were like, I'm not doing the homeless thing. So you had kind of all the hotels that we had that had unhoused people. And then you had like this one hotel that just supplied them with every vice (laughs) that you can imagine. (laughs) And so it was a constant struggle, right? So like my second day, uh, these, there was some kids that lived in the hotel we were in. I mean, kids like six and five, like children. Whoa. And yeah. they found out that you can pull an alarm. These kids were living <laughs> in the car. They've never seen a fire alarm. They pulled a fire alarm, right? And people freaked out. So the next day, this is my third day, a fire alarm goes off again. And, and I, I'm, I'm getting to know these children. They, they want to come by and play with me and ride bikes. And, stuff. and so... I go, and I know they're not doing it again. And I go to the, and the, oh, and by the way, the hotel concierge has stayed. So there's like a concierge, like a proper. Wow. That's that's kind of, it's it's interesting. So, and I go to the the concierge, I'm like, hey man, uh, where's the alarm coming from? And so there was a kind of what you would think about like a motel building where there's there's two floors and outdoor rooms. And then there was a whole tower, a six foot tower or a six story tower. And he goes, oh, it's coming off of the tower on the on the sixth floor. And I was like, those kids aren't getting inside the tower. He goes, ah, don't worry about it. It's just those kids. I was like, those kids didn't get inside the tower. Can you tell me exactly where? He goes, just look on the sixth floor. And I was like, can you call 911? He goes, I'm not calling 911. Because they get mad at us when we call 911 and there's not an emergency. 
I was like, I, I think you should call 911. So I go run up to the tower. And sure enough, there's smoke coming out of a room. And in the tower, because to get a room, we had to deal with kind of the most vulnerable population. So a lot of people with in wheelchairs, walkers, crazy health issues, a lot of older, older people. I'm talking like 70s, 80s. They're all in this tower because there's an elevator. Right. So I'm yelling at everybody to take the stairs down and I'm trying to evacuate everyone. Um, the fire department does come. And initially, because the dude doesn't see any of this, right? He's in the main building. He can't see me running and getting people out. He, he tells the fire department, I'll just go. <laughs> it's nothing. Wow. Wow. And I didn't know hotels were designed that when you have a fire in a room, they're kind of, I guess, like slanted. So when the water all comes out, it's designed to like go down a certain way. Right. So flooding, everything's flooding, right? And it's, it's just insane. There's water now and I'm trying to get people out. I'm trying to like lift people out of wheelchairs and downstairs. It's, it's a mess. And there's like a, another guy helping me. It's, it's everything that you don't want to do in an emergency situation. I am doing. And I'm not going to do this. We got to go. It's on fire. The building's on fire. We got to go. <laughs> and this guy, I will never forget this. This guy comes out and he was in a walker, older gentleman in a walker. I was like, we have to go. Come on, I'll help you downstairs. He says, I never had shit and I ain't leaving. <laughs> <laughs> and he closed the door on me. <laughs> wow. Finally, the fire department comes in, hatchet the door. And this dude was in there and, you know, he was a person that had problems at other shelters. And he was a bit of a fire bug, which might, that might be a, a bit of a derogatory term and lit his room on fire. He had took the toilet off the wall. He, he, we're all kind of amazed at that. We're like, how do you do that? And, <laughs> and he tapped tens of thousands of dollars of damage. You know, that tower was down for, for months. Um, right. j- just cause, right? And as is equal and I talk about kind of in our own personal conversations about this population. Uh, it's, there's a bit of, I almost feel like arrogance when it comes to, okay, we, we put you in a house or a room or whatever, and now we're going to walk away. Mm-hmm. Right. We're not yeah. going to, we don't, we don't, we're not going to check on you. You're done. We, we, right. Right. It's, 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 it's kind of the standard expedience model. Right. You, we do as little as possible. And also people are the most wounded. So they need more services and more attention because being evicted and homeless is terrible. I remember in my an earlier career working with children and mental health, the homeless kids we had drew differently. Kids who have a home, if there are maybe seven or eight, draw a straight line with a house on it and a tree on it, and, you know, some Vs, which are birds in the sky, whereas the homeless kids, everything was floating in the air. It -hmm. didn't end up on the line because they didn't have any kind of stability. Things didn't make sense, and they didn't settle, which was mentally unsettling as well as totally physically unsettling. And although, you know, I... I imagine they captured the mental reality of people who have to live on the street, who are thrown off out of their homes. I mean, I see in New York City, Mayor Adams, Mm -hmm. uh, who was an ex-cop himself, Mm -hmm. uh, he doesn't help those people at all, just kicks them out Mm -hmm. and destroys their belongings, whatever little they had. And those are people who need help. Well, I think what, what's also interesting is that idea of <clears throat> uh, responsibility or, or choice, because mm. that's where you can get people, right? You can say, well, we gave, like you said, we gave you the room and now you just burnt it to the ground. You know, that's, that, that's your problem, not ours. Yeah. And yes. uh, there's a really interesting Netflix documentary about 
fairness uh, i can't remember the title but i'll put mm. it in the show notes and it was talking about there was some study they'd done in norway as soon as people felt like someone had made a choice or a bad choice that's when uh inequalities are accepted because the person made a choice to do it and so they deserve whatever is coming to them as it were and that's then that explains uh a lot <laughs> in cultural society like what we accept or what we think is reasonable is based off a perception of um what people have decided to do and it doesn't take into account sort of environmental factors or history or any of that stuff it's just just the the choice then sort of as if they were making free choices as if they chose to be evicted which is or, you know, no one's choice. That means you're thrown out of your home. But it's interesting, right? It It's yeah. it's a way that you yeah, can stop, right. you can wash but, your you hand know. of responsibility at that point. Go, well, right, you, right. you chose it. Yeah, and they don't look at, at why. Why did you choose to do that? What's wrong here? And how can we fix it, well, help it? Well, to that point i have an anecdote for you guys i would love to hear your your riffing on this i'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna give you this anecdote i'm gonna step back i want to i'm really excited to hear this so when you work in these environments you work with a lot of ex-felons mm -hmm. if you commit serious crimes and you get out of prison especially in california because you can actually get a college degree in california in prison um mm -hmm. still not a lot of jobs open to you right no because yeah. the gap in your employment for the last 25 years right <laughs> And also, if they know you're a felon, there's a lot of bias. Oh, and, and, and you know, I'm working with guys that have committed capital murder, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but these guys have gotten degrees inside and have totally turned their lives around and they're clean and, and they, they just want to help, right? Mm -hmm. They really do. They really do, right? They really want to help. And there was a gentleman that I worked with and he was from the area. He's older than me. He was in his 50s. He had served his time, cleaned his life up. Whatever he was as a young man, he, was, he wasn't that anymore, right? Um, and we would have to drop off everybody's food. This is still in the, the early days of COVID. We don't, there's no vaccine, right? And we're, there's certain people that can't physically go from their room to the lobby kitchen area. So we, we deliver food, uh, dinner, and we're doing our dinner delivery. And uh, I'm showing him the... He just, he had just started. So I'm showing him the rounds and there was the, the room with the kids that, that were in it. It was, um, three kids, two moms, um, because they had known each other on the street and they said they were a couple I'm using mm -hmm. quotes couple so they could stay together. That's the only reason why. Um, right. And, and then they, they were co-parenting together ish. Mm -hmm. Right, ish. Right. Um, one was trying to clean her life up, and the other one got a roof. So it's like I got a roof now. I'm just going to go keep doing the same thing I was doing. And uh, the one that was a little messier, <laughs> so to speak, um, her mom would come in and out too, or just hang out. Her mom was there too. Their moms were there as well, which was kind of like, oh wow, this is generational, right? And so mm -hmm. as we're dropping off food, this guy I'm working with looks in the room and he goes, hey, it's been a minute. And he's talking to the mom and she's a little, she's a little high, you can tell. And uh, the guy takes me aside when we're done. He goes, I've known that woman since I was a young man. And we used to do heroin together. I used to rob stores with her husband. We'd rob stores and, and, and get all effed up and, and, uh, I did a lot of dirt with her. And he goes, you know, that, that woman, her daughter, she was with us when we were doing it. And her son is with her now as she's doing this stuff. And, and he goes, she never had a chance. And when we talk about decisions and good or bad decisions, like I, I, I'm from not the best neighborhood in a place called Richmond, California, and I've definitely seen bad decisions, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. But 
maybe because of my age, I'm 44. I also grew up in a moment where you still have this mix in these areas of there's still people that have like jobs and there's still homeowners mixed in with the people that are renting. Mm-hmm. Um, so maybe you see a little bit of, of that level of generational poverty, but um, for someone to be like, hey, when I was doing dope and robbing places and doing all this crazy stuff, this child was along with us. Yeah. So how does she then navigate the world? How does she understand relationships with people? Everything's mm-hmm. going to be about, you know, exchange. Um, really messed me up. So I'd, I'd love to hear what you guys have to say about it. Yeah, well, one of the things that is terribly wrong in America is the supposition that just because you get knocked up, you could take care of anyone (laughs) and provide them with a decent life. And um, so these children are abandoned to a lifestyle that's very destructive. In uh, other countries, like in France, if there's any trouble in the family, you get a social worker assigned for the first five years and then more if necessary. And there's constant social intervention and clothing allowances and after-school programs and all these things. And there is no protection. I think it would be an unusual child who doesn't follow in in the footsteps she's taught to follow. And is she's abandoned to that lifestyle. And I suppose she could confide in the teacher if she's ever in a stable enough environment so that she could go to the same school. But in Chicago, one of the things the teachers went on strike for was support for children whose parents are evicted. Continuity and support. Because if you're living on the street, what address do you give to keep your kid in school? Mm -hmm. There's no countervailing influence. And so that children are doomed. And I do think that the idea that if you don't have money, you're thrown on the slag heap in the United States is the United States is a more unadulteratedly capitalist nation than, let's say, the Scandinavian countries or even France and Germany and even England, which is unfortunately too close to the United States, but not as close. The idea that the market should decide and that children are abandoned to the fortunes of their families. Even those people who have um, curtailed abortion rights don't do anything to support children once they're out. And so they're abandoned. The family system is really destructive. And the other developed nations support parents by having family leaves, family vacations, social workers, School, you can drop your kid off at daycare in France starting at zero for a dollar an hour, Mm. and then it's free at three. And there are the social workers there, the mental health workers there. There's a supportive apparatus to save people. Yeah, one of the the really interesting uh, podcasts as well that we did was with uh, Rodrigo Aguilera, and he was talking about what he'd come across, which was that in Scandinavia, the Mm. inequality is exactly the same before redistribution, right? Right. Like it's, it's the, it's the culture, the political choice to redistribute via the tax system, et cetera, that, that changes the outcomes um, of everyone's life. And I think the interesting thing about this idea of personal responsibility and choice that it's so embedded in the culture and it's so almost just common sense that you, that it's sort of a default position. Um, that and how, how that idea has, uh, is just so prevalent, it, it, you know, in the UK, but clearly in the, in the States as well. And you need it, uh, to justify the sort of economic political situation you're in. Right. It has to be about personal responsibility and choice, because if it's not, it's a lot more complicated. The whole all these problems. <laughs> right. Yeah, well, it's class blind. One of the reasons personal choice 
excises from the analysis social forces that shape people who are shaped much more socially than they are just individually. I mean, it, and racism, sexism, and class divisions are totally determinant or, or almost totally determinant in the United States. The state prisons are filled with the large percentage of people from seven blocks in the city, which are the worst in terms of housing, education, and poverty. So, you know, it's the capitalist pretense that we all start out as equals. Yeah, it's uh, this is uh, both to Jason and Ekoi. Is is this idea of personal responsibility and choice? Do you see it play out with the people that you've worked with and come across? Do they have the? Is there a sort of internalization, a sort of self blame for the situations they find themselves in? That's a good question. There, I mean, there's a couple of layers. One, I think, you know, from a societal standpoint, we need a very, very visible underclass. They serve as quote unquote corrective examples of like, look, you could, you know, end up like these people. Right. Um, you know, so it's so motivation in a sort of really fucked up way. You know, people tune into YouTube motivation videos to like go out there and get money for uh, <laughs> for the big company they work for. Like, I know someone who 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 does that. They they watch motivational videos in the morning, and I'm just like, sh- surely that's a sign <laughs> <laughs> that that you know what you're doing isn't fulfilling. You have to sort of brainwash yourself in the morning to convince yourself, like, oh, I'm doing something good. Um, anyway. <clears throat> as a side but yeah it's like a dark motivational thing isn't it it's like yeah i don't want to i don't want to end up like that so i better i better go work for evil corp etc exactly sorry to interrupt it's, 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 it, oh no uh, no oh you, I, I would say it's complicated because I, I think sometimes people have enough self-realization to understand that there there was some zigs where they maybe should have zagged yeah, because not everybody comes from you know multi layers of of poverty. There was a good amount of people right. that I met that actually kind of went down some drug rabbit holes. Yes. Um, oh, definitely. Is there you know are there bad choices that are are made? Surely. Oh like, yeah. I I, yeah. I think I think it would be impossible to you know work in certain sectors of the population where. You know, you're the majority of your day is, you know, you sitting there going like, oh, you made some really good choices in life, right? Like that is that is not uh, what what happens. You know, the the major thing, though, is that like, you know, a good society is a society that allows people to fail and recover. Mm. Failing and recovering is really interesting. And. I really got to see that as a young man because I went to a different high school that wasn't in the city I lived in. So I got to see kids get in fights. We didn't have security guards in my high school. I got to see kids do hard drugs, um, uh, drink at a young age. And, and uh, one friend that was so drunk when he was on the pitcher's mound, he was telling the batters just to move out of the way because he didn't know where the ball was going. And and that was a joke. And he's living his life. He's fine. He never had to pay for those, those quote-unquote mistakes. And they were looked at as, well, these are the things that you do when you're young. Young, right. Juxtaposed a- to where I grew up. Um, the kids at Richmond High that did this, which is a school where they do the movie Coach Carter. Mm -hmm. Um, those same mistakes cost you Mm -hmm. you were either expelled um incarcerated right it it was a it was a very very different world when it came to mistakes your parents didn't have money to get you out of trouble right uh, if you got arrested for like minor again both kids are doing the same thing i live that's right Oh, when absolutely. I go home, the cats are drinking and doing dope. When I go to 
high school cats are drinking and doing dope, but it's just the environment in which it's done in a so different one environment. And, and I, I actually, I can't even say they're not heavily policed because where I went to high school was one square mile. It's a place called Albany, California. It's right outside of Berkeley. It's one square mile. It's a pretty nice little suburb full of like, you know, what we would call woke, <laughs> woke people. But um, it, it was somewhat policed because the police had nothing to do. So they messed with, with the kids. Yeah. Um, but it, it was just so different um, in the treatment and, and the repercussions for these quote unquote youthful transgressions. Um, yeah. Right. So when you work at a shelter, you're seeing kind of the end result of the people that didn't have the benefit of the the middle and upper class. Right. 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 Well, because, you know, it's one of those things where like you have, there is a a definite class element, like, you know, the people that are made examples of. Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely. Definitely. So when it comes to like people thinking about personal responsibility, I think there was, there was a certain group of people that would always talk to you. Um, I didn't, I didn't have an office. I had an office. I could have separated myself and I chose not to. So I just stayed in the lobby because I was like, if you have a problem, just come to me. Like just, it's just easier. Just, (laughs) I'll just stay here and and be that guy. Um, So there were people that were like, you know, when I was younger, I did this. I was a prostitute. I got shot. I don't want to be. I got my kid taken away. I'm trying to get my life right. There was definitely a, a fair amount of the population that was like that. They knew that they made some bad choices, and they were trying to correct those choices. Um, and I do think when you are vocal about trying to correct those choices, people will try to help you, especially in services, because you're easy. A decoy can vouch for this. Sometimes you're a little easier to work with. Yeah. Um, sometimes. Uh, sometimes. So, <laughs> sometimes. And then there's people sometimes. that are just, you know, gone. Yeah. You know? Right. Well, I think, you know, there is a, I think a lot of times, sometimes people kind of conflate oppositional pers- uh, issues with people that have like serious, serious issues. Um, and, you know, I think somebody that has a quote unquote bad attitude and, and somebody with serious problems are very different things, different like categories of, of need that need addressing. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the issues with like a lot of the, the chronic long term homeless people have pretty serious mental health needs that isn't just. Put, like providing housing. Yeah, and not everybody wants housing. I think that's another thing. You, you know, when we were talking about this, what we were going to discuss, and I want to bring this up, and I, Igor, you can definitely elaborate on this with all the big, the sciencey doctor words. <laughs> but <laughs> w- there's people that you deal with that have been in services sometimes since birth. I'm talking foster care. They messed up and, and got incarcerated in the youth carceral system. Then they've been in and out of shelters and prisons. And then you tell them, well, because of this, you qualify for, for housing. And they're like, well, I don't, I don't know how to live on my own. Um, right. Definitely. Even women that have dealt with abuse. Like I saw this happen a lot too, where um, maybe they got the abusive guy out but they qualify for housing now and they can get housing. So they bring the guy back because they don't feel comfortable living alone. Right. Which always made me go like, yikes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and, and then there would be people that would straight up say, nah, because it's not permanent. Right. I mean, there's, there's one aspect that that's not permanent. Um, it's also one of those things where like, I think I remember what he was, he wasn't a client of mine, but he was a homeless guy that I talked to a lot, you know, and um, that used to uh, hang out near my workplace. But one of the things that he said was also just like, well, you know, because I was trying to see if he, if I could at least get him started on signing up for section eight, because, you know, he obviously qualified um, Sorry, can I just ask an ignorant question? What is Section 8? Section 8 
is basically the subsidized housing. That's just a UK question. I'm sure everyone in the States understands that, but I'm just slowing it no. down. <laughs> it's, it's a little different because you have to, there, the, the, A, the apartment has to take your voucher and B, right. getting a Section 8 voucher where you're going to get rental assistance is extremely difficult. Right. Yes, it is. Yeah. yeah. And it's also like, you know, a, a five plus year. I mean, it's a long wait list. You know, you yeah. sign up, you, you, you have to wait for a long time. But, you know, one of the things about, you know, I, I'm in the process of like, you know, trying to encourage him to like sign up for um, Section 8, sign up for a lot of the social services that he was entitled to, you know, but especially in terms of the housing, he was just like, oh, I mean, even if I get Section 8 and I get into an apartment, I get kicked out anyways. Oh, yeah. There's there's all kinds of, of rules and regulations. Relations, especially when right. you because there's different levels of housing. You know, right. Section Eight is going to be for a person that probably has a job at the very least, right? Or you have to contribute something. You have to contribute. It's very little, you know. So, and and there were programs that we had where right. some people's rent was thirty five dollars a month, mm-hmm. right? Um, and and the people that are going to qualify for housing, and this is where the housing gets real weird for a lot of people to understand. You're probably part of a real, I want to say they use the term vulnerable part of the population. So you probably have severe mental illness. You might have a severe health problem. You're probably a little older. So you're going to need a lot of support. Yeah. Just yeah. to, just to get by every day. And people look at housing as, look, okay, we want a house, we want a house, we want a house. And I feel like this is just how I've feel. I feel like the reason why people feel this way is because, you know, coming from the Bay Area, especially cities like San Francisco, which I was just at with my, my three-year-old, there's so many people on the street yeah. and the makeup yeah. of San Francisco has really changed when it comes to who's there and, and, and mm-hmm. who's kind of uh, taken aback by it. Because when you walk into, and I did some contract work for some tech companies, when you walk into these offices, they're awesome. They're gorgeous. Everything you can ever want is in these in these buildings, and when you walk outside, you see people defecating on the street, people shooting in front of you. It's and it's that blight they don't want to see, right? Mm-hmm. So it feels like uh, mayors are trying to find a way to take it and put it somewhere where it's out of view of the public eye, right? Mm-hmm. Because the tax paying public is is getting really frustrated with you know right. And one of the things they don't want to do is work with the children and the people to help them get their lives in order and get a sense of hope. So they're not always committing crimes or shooting up or something like that. But the whole social structure to support people in making different decisions isn't there. What did you mean when everyone says temporary? If you get a room at a hotel, Mm -hmm. do they tell people this is temporary? You're going to be kicked out as soon as the hotels pick up business? You were told that you are a guest. This is not your room. You never. It's not your home. Okay. Because the goal was permanent, something that the governor of California really pushes is called, called permanent supportive housing. It sounds very good. And in theory, it should be housing that actually offers mental health support, right? Job placement support if you actually can qualify to work, um, child care support. It should offer all those things. Doesn't always offer all those things, and it's temporary because if a developer builds housing or rehabs housing. They're only on the hook for a certain contract for so many years. Once that's up, they can kick everybody out if they want and then charge market rate rents. Right. So that it's, you know, it's basically if you get any help, it's mm-hmm. temporary. Mm-hmm. And you, you can't count on the kind of ongoing support you need. And, and what that does is it causes an adversarial relationship with people in government. Because anyone, even if you work for an NGO, you're looked at as kind of like part of the system. Because in a way you are, right? You're an extension of the system. Mm-hmm. Um, it's always adversarial. And I don't care what color you are. 
I don't care what gender you are. You're the man. You're the bad guy. And it, and the e can tell you, it takes a hell of a mental toll because you don't get into this work because you need a paycheck. You'll be out of it in a couple of weeks. Right. You know, you have to truly care. And not everybody, you know, is a, a hammer and sickle socialist leftist. You're going to have some Republicans in the mix. <laughs> yeah, ironically enough. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? But ultimately, ultimately, everyone working in this environment cares about people enough that they go to work every day. Mm -hmm. There is no support for the people that are trying to support the people that nobody wants to deal with. Right. That's right. And the stories you hear on a daily basis, the way you're treated on a daily basis, because you're constantly trying to get programs, you're, trying to, you're constantly trying to find a way to really help people out. You know, I was in these hotel environments, again, they're not built for surveillance. A lot of ass whoopings happen in those places. Mm -hmm. A lot of domestic violence happens in those places. Right. And here's the thing nobody wants to talk about. Ain't nobody going nowhere. You're not getting kicked out for beating your girlfriend, wife, kid, et cetera. There's nobody gets a warning on who's on Megan's Law's list for child molestation when you got little kids running around all hours of the night. Mm -hmm. These are dangerous <laughs> places. Yeah. And so you're either going to try to just contain the problem which would most people want to do, let's just contain it. Or you can try to look at it as a, as a chance to have a transformative society. Can we have groups where men can deal with their violent pasts? Can we get support groups where women can deal with the violence that, that they are, are, are yeah. doing? You know, we tried to do that. We couldn't even get drug counseling in there. People at every day, Jay, can we get AA? Jay, can we get some kind of meeting? Like, Y'all are going to have to do it yourselves. Because they're not, they're not giving me any, any drug counselors. They said they, they don't have them. Hmm. Well, they won't pay for them, in other words. Yeah. Yeah, you know, Susie Schwartz wrote a book called Dreams from the Monster Factory. I think it's the best book on the prison system that I ever read. And because what she did was because she was a lawyer and kept getting people off and then they'd go back in again. She redesigned a prison and got some money for it. It was very successful. It cut down recidivism rates 75 percent. But they didn't have people locked in cages. They had the guards among the other people. Everyone had to be educated. Everybody had to be involved in an education program. Everybody had to be in a therapy program, and it worked really well. And of course, they didn't refund it because the, I think partly it's these systems are designed as much for punishment mm. as for help because being poor is, is a crime in this, mm. this capitalist society. Mm. It's not capitalism that's criminal it's the poor mm -hmm. and they're run as if the poor have too much and the rich never have enough and that's how the funds are allocated because they're determined the people who pull the strings that uh, control the politicians movements are the billionaires that give them contributions towards election and so it's a difficult system and if the homeless could actually get organized enough to realize how they'd been wronged and do something about it and demonstrate, that would be great. And I think that happened in the 30s with those marches of the dispossessed down the streets of Fifth Avenue and all over New York and uh, organized by the communist and socialist parties. They'd be there when you were evicted to move your furniture back in. But that was a much more militant environment that understood social responsibility and that the capitalism isn't helpful here. And partly it's a, a depoliticized population. Mm. 
Otherwise, it could be quite impressive marches of the homeless in New York City. I, I, well, I have some good news for you. Good. Here's some good news for you. Randy Shaw, I, I'll, I'll hook you guys up with Randy, who has been working with the unhoused, I want to say for the last 40 years in San Francisco. Mm. Um, he organizes with the, with, with the unhoused. And they, they're organizing efforts and their, their big pushes uh, have caused the mayor to uh, add funding to their facility so they can actually, wow. you know, get, you know, $15 million of the repairs that they need. Like, that's huge. It's huge. And that comes mm-hmm. from, like, what you're saying, organizing, having a goal, and going for it. And understanding oh. that whoever's in power doesn't matter. Hmm. London Bree right. and, yeah. you know, leftist mayor. Nope. Right? But the pressure was on. Yeah. And she had to capitulate to the demands of an angry population, a business class that wants to leave because of said population. Yeah. So that that to me gave me uh, some hope. This conversation continues for nearly another hour as a patron-only episode, covering further topics like propaganda, wrestling, non-linear warfare, AIDS, Black Panther, the hero's journey, and Star Wars. So if any of that sounds interesting, head over to patreon.com forward slash is not just in your head and listen now. And a massive thank you as always to our VIP patrons, Alex Placito, Bruce Rogers Vaughan, Jennifer Cox, Justin Harper, Rebecca Johns, Seamus O'Connell, and Sheena Belmas. If you have enjoyed anything you've heard Harriet say in this program, you will definitely enjoy Capitalism Hits Home, which is a solo program that Harriet does through Democracy at Work, which is a worker-owned cooperative that produces other great programs such as Economic Update with Richard Wolff and the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles with David Harvey. I can't recommend enough that everyone also listen to Capitalism Hits Home if you enjoy It's Not Just in Your Head. And you can hear more from Harriet on her radio show called Interpersonal Update. It's on WBAI at 2.30 EST on Wednesday afternoons and in the WBAI archives.